Okay, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Gary Matsuoka, and we're here at Laguna Hills Nursery in Santa Ana, and today's class is, we added one to it, so it's supposed to be apples and pears, and then we added bananas because we just harvested a crop of suckers, so we'll talk about that too. So the, for, up until about 1990, the, the apples weren't thought to grow here very well, and neither were pears. So it's kind of recent that they discovered that almost every apple, now Dave Wilson, the company that grows these apples for us, they put in an orchard in Irvine at the field station about 10, 12 years ago just to see what was going on because they had all these reports of apples succeeding in Southern California where they're not supposed to because apples originated in a more tempered climate. But they found that all but two of the varieties they had planted, all but two of the cultivars they had planted, made a good commercial crop. So now we're not as as hesitant to sell them, although unfortunately one of the two that didn't make a good crop was Honeycrisp, which is, you know, most people's favorite apple right at the moment. Uh, it'll fruit here. It just, you know, if you ask Dave Olson, they'll say, oh, it fruits here. It doesn't get any size. So apples and the pears are very similar in that they do have what is called a minimum till requirement for the winter. So they come from areas of the world that experience some warm spells in the winter. So they want to have a mechanism that keeps them sleeping all the way through the winter so that they don't bloom too early, make their crop, and then get a freeze. So they each bud on the growth bud on the branches has a chemical in it that inhibits it from starting to develop and, and sprout out in the spring with the first heat wave. It's got this chemical that's destroyed by apparently by the cool temperatures between 34 and 40, excuse me, 34 and 55. Mm -hmm. uh, you get more destroying of that chemical right around 44, 45 less as you get down to 34 and less as you get up to 55, but you still get some, quote, chill on them if you spend time between those hours. Uh, most apples would like to get 500 to 1,000 hours of chill. We only get about, well, in the past 10 years, it's been like 80 hours to uh, about 320 hours. So we're not really getting close to most what apples mostly want. Uh, but they produce anyway. They still, they have a, mo well, most fruit trees, if they don't get their chill, they eventually wake up. So, in the case of this tree here, so these two trees came to us from an uh, area near Fresno, Wilcox, uh, which gets easily a thousand hours of chill every winter. They came to us about mid-winter or mid-chill. So they came to us with good chill already. So when we got to late winter, they decide to wake up. So they've been growing since around March or so. Um, this tree overwintered here. So it didn't get any chill, but now it's starting to wake up. So if you have an apple tree that overwintered here, this is typically what you'll see. It's, it's waking up now in May. Um, the thing about at most apples, though, is that most of the ones that have a chill that we can't reach ripen in the fall. So they've got enough time to develop just about to full size. Most of them ripen a little later here than they would if they were up in central California or especially up in Oregon. Oregon, uh, the closer you get to Canada, the longer the summer days and the faster apples develop. They said it, it, when they took... Um, Granny Smith to uh, Oregon, because Granny Smith actually came from Sydney, Australia, which is interesting because Sydney is like Mazatlan, Mexico, doesn't have any chill at all. Uh, it, it grows, develops much faster there because they're much closer to the Arctic Circle in Oregon than they are in Australia, so uh, the apples develop quicker. Here, same problem. Uh, the, well, unfortunately, the disadvantage that pears have is they'll still bloom and fruit even though they don't get their chill, but pears generally ripen in the summer. So they just don't have as much time. So if they don't get their chill, 
you get really small. Well, same thing with apples. Like Honeycrisp apple, you get apples that big because they bloom. Usually honey, Honeycrisp has a really high chill requirement, over a thousand hours. And what happens is it blooms here right around July and it ripens in August. It only has a month to develop. So they only get this big. They taste fine. They taste like Honeycrisp is supposed to taste, but they didn't have enough time to get any size. And the same thing happens with most European pears. Uh, we tried one Bartlett for 10 years and got pears about the size of ping pong balls. So that's the problem. And most Asian pears, same thing. So the pears aren't quite as reliable. The apples have been quite reliable, except for just a few, just because of their the time it's for development. Now, we train them about the same way. So apples and pears. Now, the one thing about apples and pears to know, too, is they are among the most tolerant of poor soil of any <laughs> plant known. Pear trees, probably the most tolerant of, you know, if you if someone does your soil wrong, puts a lot of compost in the ground, robs the soil of all its oxygen, the pear trees will survive. So one of the reasons they use, like, the streets here are lined with ornamental pear trees. The one reason they use those is because they don't kill them. If the, if the grower grows them in compost, they plant them in compost like they were taught to, the pears don't die because they don't need much oxygen around their roots. Apples, same way. They don't need as much oxygen around the roots. Unfortunately, apples do need soil that looks wet at all times. If it doesn't look wet, the trees are not happy. So in this drought year we've got going this year, uh, you will have to live with a lot of brown tipping on the leaves. They'll pick that up. It does not look as happy during a drought year. Now with any production tree, you want to keep them fairly wet from the time they're blooming until the time the fruit is. Now, the first three or four weeks when they're blooming is critical for water. Otherwise, they abort their flowers if they're feeling dry. There's a period when the fruit is about that big that it doesn't need quite as much water. But then as we approach the ripening day, within about a month of the ripening day, you got to water good because that helps the fruit size up. So with both apples and pears, there are periods during the development when ample water is not essential, but uh, they do like a lot of water at that time. And then after you pick the fruit, you can pretty much turn the water off. So non pears that does happen in the summer. Most apples, it's in the fall. Now, we train them both the same way. So the ideal is to have as many horizontal branches as you can. So with apples and pears, there's a couple of ways you can train them. Uh, a lot of orchards, you want to make them look like Christmas trees. So you have tiers of branches about a foot apart going up the trunk. And each tier is a little bit shorter than the last. So something like that. Or uh, one of the other methods now is just to train them on a wire, espalade them kind of like you would a grape. So you just throw the branches in two dimensions this way. Now they do bush out forward and back, but the reason we're doing these styles now, like, okay, if you see a book, read a book from 50, 60 years ago, they'll tell you, Cut your trunk short, force it to go wide, keep forcing it so it's got a whole bunch of upright trunks and a whole bunch of horizontal branches. The reason they're getting away from that is they found that if you grow a tree 20 foot across, the center of it doesn't get enough light. So you're wasting a lot of your, your best production there, especially if Say this is south over here and the sun's coming from this direction. This whole side of the tree is in shade. This side gets all the light from the sun hitting it like this. This side's not getting much, so no use even having that side. So they started doing one side bases, and then they said, oh, let's just make it flat. <clears throat> so you just make it flat so the sun hits one side of this in the morning and the other side in the afternoon.
And so you don't want to let it grow much wider than, say, six or eight foot. And maybe eight to ten foot so you can still pick the fruit on them. So you can see this one, which we didn't grow. We got this from another grower. They didn't really train them. So here we're missing potentially a lot of branches in this area here. Now this one came to us this last winter with nice branching. So you can kind of clean it out after, say, the summer. It's nice to get the branches to turn horizontal. So what happens on both apples and pears, if the branches are heading upwards like this, uh, not only might they be another trunk, but the only place that gets enough sunlight to make fruit is the last pair of leaves on the branch. So you get flowers on the tips of each branch, and that's it, because down here it's shaded itself. So if you grow them horizontally, what happens? Well, two things happen. When you grow a branch perfectly flat, it stops growing this way. You have to leave the end curled up a little bit if you want to let it grow longer. But once you lay it down totally flat, it stops growing this way. All these buds start waking up, and they start making little side branches. Now, sometimes they want to be another trunk and go straight up. You just clip them. You clip them short all summer long. Keep clipping. Now, uh, the growing season for most temperate climate plants like this is spring and summer. So you just clip, clip in this out. during the summer. Don't get, let them get too long. And then come fall, you clip them one more time. And then during the fall, they develop the flower buds at the end of their short branches. So you have a lot of little branches forming along this branch. And this is where your best apples form. Now, the first few years, you only get apples on the tips. But those apples are more subject to sun burning. So you, you know, you have more trouble with those apples. The branches that form on the horizontal branches as the tree matures will be your better quality apples. Now when Fuji first came out in the 1960s and 70s, it was a big hit because it was really sweet and very firm, never got mushy in the stores. Um, but the growers got a little greedy, and by the late 80s, we noticed that, boy, the Fuji apples in the store were really bland. What happened to their sweetness? So they, they figured out, the universities figured out, oh, the growers are growing too many apples on the tree. And the more apples that are on the tree, and the, the smaller the fruit gets, and the less sugars in the fruit. So it gets really bland. So they had uh, researchers determine how many apples on the tree could the tree <laughs> successfully make good quality fruit. So they counted leaves, counted fruit, they determined that one fruit needed about 27 leaves on the tree to make a good quality fruit. If you have more fruit than that, you're not gonna have much flavor. And you will notice that if you buy apples at the store, the bigger the apples are, mint the less apples on the tree and the better they taste. So you buy those bags of the little apples and you eat them, they got no flavor. Those, there are too many, the grower left too many apples on the tree. So the little apples have no taste, the bigger apples have better flavor. So training, now this tree only came with one branch, which is not very good. So what we would do with a plant like this is perhaps keep this branch, or you can cut it short, cut this short too, and what will happen is wherever you cut it, it starts making a lot of branches. So you train two or three or even four going horizontally and take one of them and go straight up again. And then another foot up, you trim it again, and the top four or five buds open up, make branches, train most of them horizontal, go straight up with another one. Uh, we have such a long growing season here, you can probably do that two or three times during the year and make several tiers on this tree. Now, apples are really good at making more branches, so even if you don't do that, you'll probably have quite a few. Now, this one is suckering. So, on this particular apple tree here, I'll just hold it. The graft is right here on this trunk. And these branches are coming from the rootstock below ground. And you can see the leaves are somewhat different looking. 
So those you'll pull, you can cut those down, cut them out, get them out of the way. Uh, apples sucker a bit. They're, it never seems to become a major problem with the trees. So if you don't remove them, they don't tend to take over the plant. Like with citrus, sometimes if you let them sucker, the sucker just takes over the entire plant. But uh, the apples aren't so bad now. Uh, most of our apples are on what is called semi-dwarf rootstock. The rootstock... Um, Designation is M-111. It's a semi-dwarf rootstock. They grow apples on standard rootstocks too, but standard apple trees, well, the advantage of being standard is the roots are a little bit stronger and more drought resistant than these are. But the apple trees tend to be so vigorous that they don't produce for about five years. On a semi dwarf root stock, they're not too bad with the water, uh, and they tend to produce within one or two years. So much quicker to get production. Uh, standard apple trees on standard root stocks can hit 25 foot or higher. Semi dwarf tend to be less than 20. We usually, we do one other root stock, occasionally two M7. I don't know if I have any more apples left on M M7. And that keeps them right around 10 feet, but uh, needs a bit more water. So the dwarf root stocks, now there are some other dwarf root stocks, M9, but M9 always needs a stake. It can't stand up by itself. It's too weak to stand up. But a lot of the orchards use that when they do a spalliard apples, use the M9 or, or the M7 to make a spalliard apples because they're all supported anyway. And there's other rootstocks, a lot of rootstocks that they are using on apples that control the height somewhat. But yeah, you just watch it because of the water. Okay. So training wise, the nice thing about, okay, the other nice thing about apples and pears, both are very tolerant of pruning wounds. Apples are supposed to be the best tree known or the best plant known around the world at tolerating pruning wounds. So, so most plants you can prune them, like if you prune a peach tree like this, cut it like this, and then you cut them back a month to cut an inch below it, that it can't really seal that wound twice, so it, it dies back quite a ways and then seals. It, it just doesn't have the ability to seal the wound over and over and over again. Apples seem to be able to seal any wound and grow like nothing happened. So you can take an old apple tree, cut it to a stump, let it regrow, not a big deal. If you do that to a peach tree, you'll kill it. You cut it down a big stump, you'll just kill the tree. It can't heal that, can't seal that big wound that you just made. But apples and pears are very, very sealing. The downfall of apples and pears are both very subject to one bad disease called fire blight. Now fire blight is a disease that bees happen to carry. It's interesting. So the bees are the ones that cause that are the vector for it. Uh, it's a bacterial infection that apples and pears, along with their relatives, loquats, uh, pyracantha, and uh, oh, what's the other fruit that's related? Uh, quince. They can all catch fire blight. And fire blight kind of looks like the, this might be fire blight. On this, this was a flower little flowering thing here and if you can see it it turned charcoal black now there's another two to two bacterial diseases can or a bacterial disease and a fungus you can call that one's called blossom blast but fire blight can do that too so fire blight's a bacterial infection that bees carry and it's interesting a um you know the Fire blight can kill the branch of a pear or apple tree, and the dead branch is sitting there all summer long, just dead. But in the winter rains, when the rain soaks that area, the bacteria from the fire blight oozes to the surface, but it's got this amber look to it, so it looks like honey. So the bees kind of see that, and they check it out. They just land on it, test it, now it's on honey, but now it's on their bodies and they take it to a flower and it and it transmits into the flower 
and then in the, it's like a gangrene inflection just goes down the stem it can go through the trunk up and down the trunk on especially on young trees and wipe out the whole planet it, the back uh, the bacteria kind of shuts down the flow of sap through that stem so what you do when you're when the tree is blooming so here's a, a blooming branch on an apple tree that just finished blooming see normally the petals they the buds are on apples anyway are pink and they open white and as they dry up, they just kind of turn this tan color. Well, if the petals turn black on, you just grab this whole thing, this whole cluster of flowers, and and break it off, get rid of it. If you see it turn black on you, because um, that's a sign of fire blight when those petals turn dark, gray or black. Just snap that off before it gets in there. Um, there is a spray that we can use that will help stop fire blight, which is uh, very non-toxic. That's called uh, Monterey Garden Foss. I'll write that down. And in many states, it's just registered as a fertilizer. It's uh, monoamine dipotassium salts of phosphorus acid. One, both potassium and phosphorus are, are important uh, nutrients to plants, but what they're doing is they're overloading the plant system with phosphorus that seems to keep their immunity system going real good, so it fights off the, the bacteria infection. Um, and it, since it's not registered as a fungicide, there's really no wait time. You can, well, in California it's registered as a fungicide, but on the instructions, there's no wait time if you have, you know, I mean, generally we do it when it's blooming, so there's no fruit to eat anyway. But if there was fruit on there, they don't really, they don't say you have to wait because mm -hmm. it's just a fertilizer that you're spraying on it. Now, you might have also noticed that there, these make clusters. So when they bloom, there's usually a cluster of between three and nine flowers in a cluster. Um, of this cluster, you only want, say, one to develop. And uh, if the clusters are too close together, just pick it off. You don't want the apples or the fruit on pears to touch each other. You want to be well hanging. So this has got three clusters that will form. Up. Well, it would have had three clusters form on the end of this branch. And we would have to take off all but one fruit. To give it a chance. Now, the other reason you don't want more than one develop is this branch may not be strong enough to hold three uh, little pears or apples on it. So when they're about the size of your thumbnail is the time you start cutting them off. And be careful when you're pruning uh, apples and pears. If you do uh, prune an area that looks like it might have had fire blight, you got to clean your pruner before you touch your tree again, pruners will certainly spread fire blight from one branch to another. So if you see anything that's, you know, they call it fire blight because it looks like the branch has been torched. And most apples and pears, trees that are old, will have areas of fire blight. It's just hard to keep it totally under control. Uh, so be careful when you are when you use your pruners, you can clean your pruners with 10% uh, bleach. You can also prune it with a flame, but a flame can destroy your metal, so. <laughs> The fruit touch when they develop. Now, you know, 40 years ago, we didn't have this problem here, but now we have um, the coddling moth. Caterpillar larvae is the apple worm. Um, generally, the coddling moth has to hide the eggs it lays, and it lays them right on the fruit. But it has to hide them because if there's a lot of predators, you know, like lacewing larvae and ladybird larvae and all those things walking around all the time looking for things to eat and the eggs would be a one to do. So they usually have to hide them. They hide them either where two fruit are touching like this, where the fruit is touching a branch. That's where they hide the eggs. Yeah, they just slide them in there so that their ladybugs and other things are less likely to find them. So when you have two apples touching, you always find 
they often find a hole in both apples right where they're touching because the, egg, the eggs were laid there and the caterpillars entered the fruit in that area and they're inside the fruit. So uh, one of the things to do is to thin them out to one per cluster and that way most of the calling moth damage is no longer going to occur. Few apples we see that it still occurs. John and Gold still get worms, even if you have them hanging cleanly. Mutsu apples, uh, these are extra big apples. For some reason, the extra big apples seem to get calling moth damage more than the smaller apples. When you make sure that the, the fruit's hanging singly, you rarely get damage on most of the other fruits. So. Now this, you can see this pear tree here, I, we didn't bother, I mean, we, since it's in a pot, it's hard to train the branches horizontally, but if we did, they would develop more flowering wood than they did here, which is on the tip of the branch. No. Now, in the old days, what they did with uh, apples and pears both is they just told everyone, let the branches grow really tall and really long, so they get up there around 20, you know, 15, 20 foot. And then the weight of the branch would bring the branch horizontal. And then they would start fruiting better. But that took a long time. I mean, you're waiting 10 years to get your apple into production. If you just force the branches sideways, they'll be producing the next year. But that's how we did it back in the 80s. You know, they kept telling, well, well, what they told us to do in the wintertime, you take this horizontal, this vertical branch, just cut it down to, to a side bud so that it would force the branch to grow this way. So I was doing that and the new branch would just go straight up another 10 feet. And I did that for years. I was going, okay, I'm cutting this branch back and it's not really helping it grow sideways. It just keeps growing straight up. So I just gave up trying to grow that thing. But it turns out a few years later, I said, oh, just leave it long and let it weigh itself down. Now they just say force it, make it grow horizontal and you'll get fruit production right away. And some of the trees we're getting from the growers are shaped really nicely already. We don't know how they do it. It may be certain rootstocks promote that more horizontal growth on it. We're not quite sure. Now, nowadays, if you know, with in orchards, um, well, in the old days, they would have to spray to keep the calling moths out because, you know, they, it was really hard for orchards to go through and thin their orchards that well. So they would spray rare chemical pesticides for calling moths. Uh, now we have spinosad, which is organic, which will work if you really want to make sure you don't get any worms. But you'd have to do it every few weeks from the time the fruit's about the size of a golf ball or so. So it's quite still quite a bit of work. <laughs> Now, the other thing that happened in the 80s was they started doing a lot of organic orchards and they want to know how to grow apples organically without spraying them before the calming moths. So the University of California said, number two paper bag, um, get a knife and cut a hole. I've got to bring my knife up here. Cut a hole, slice a hole in the bottom of it, and you just slide that over the fruit and then roll up the other end and the apple will develop in the bag with, with no damage from birds or anything. Because birds can't recognize the paper bag as being food. So they said that prevented any harm to the fruit, although inside the paper bag they didn't maybe color up quite as nicely as they would in more light. But that that's one method of keeping worms and birds and things from getting to your apple. Uh, Sunset Magazine in the 1990s said, no, a Ziploc bag works better. They said you cut a little hole or punch a little hole in one corner to let any uh, moisture out of the bag and then just put this over the bag and zip it up. And they said that all the apples that formed in the bags had better color and better flavor than the ones that didn't. Now, I don't know if this will stop a squirrel. Um, it probably will stop birds and, and other, and, you know, and, and the moths from eating it, but they claim that the Ziploc, I haven't checked all these. Um, 
It's a lot but, of work. Yeah, it's a bit, <laughs> bit of work. But that's that the claims that were made. Um, one of our friends buys these and just puts them over and close the bag, which is a little easier to take on and take off. But that probably wouldn't stop a squirrel. Okay, other pests. Uh, they got aphids occasionally. We usually would just use, if you really want to control that. I mean, most aphids, the attacks are very temporary. They're like, a, they last a week or two, and then the ladybugs finally clean them up. The doctor products do a pretty good job on that. Uh, some apples sometimes get mildew on the leaves with weather like we're having right now. And uh, the oils, again, like the essential oils, this is uh, Dr. Vital Stop Disease Control Fungicide. It's rosemary, clove, and peppermint oil. And you spray that on the mildew, uh, and it cleans it up pretty good, too. This one was uh, rosemary, sesame, peppermint, thyme, cinnamon, and garlic. More for uh, bug control. But yeah, other than the coddling moths, we don't have too many other pests that we have to worry about. Um, mainly it's water. The big, big problem we're going to have this year is water. Mm -hmm. I remember back in the, it was the late nineties, my apple trees weren't looking good. I thought, boy, there's something going wrong with these. Um, but the next year, 1998, we had like 35 inches of rain and they looked perfect. So you go, okay, I just wasn't watering quite enough on those. So they, they like it wet. They, the, the growers in Oregon don't know how anyone in California can grow apples. They said you need like, <laughs> um, a water reservoir of, of like five inches of water in the ground. Five inches, well, five inches of water would be several feet deep. Uh, in order to grow a good crop of apples. They don't like any dry soil around them at all, but uh, we do okay. Now, the one thing about growing apples, you can grow them in containers. Um, we get, we have our own good potting soil for growing them in pots. Um, now, apples do tolerate bad soil, like this one's in the grower's compost and dirt mixture, and it does okay in that. It, they never will look as good as ours do. Um, the Steve Olson sales rep does come through our store several times a year and he always says our trees look better than any other nursery mm -hmm. he's ever been to. Um, and they, he says they also grow way faster than anyone else's too. Uh, but we use our, our top pot potting soil, which has no, say, compost in it. It's, it's, uh, uh, peat moss, uh, the Volcanic rock, sponge rock, sand, two-thirds of it is inert material, just like the soil is. Uh, One-third peat, a little bit of charcoal to hold minerals in it, but um, the plants do very well on that for, for a long time. I mean, most container plants, you can keep them going in the pot for about 10 years. Now, the disadvantage of apples, uh, not so much pears, but apples, is that you don't like hot dirt. So it's nice to keep these shaded during the summer or, you know, a lot of times the foliage of the apple tree itself will keep the soil sh shaded. But if the soil in the pots gets really hot, the apple trees look a bit cooked. So it's nice to keep the container, the black plastic at least, out of the sunlight. Pears aren't so bad. They seem to be able to tolerate the heat better. In fact, pears have been grown in the high deserts of California. The heat doesn't seem to bother them as much. Apples, they said, the apples generally do not like to be above 90 degrees for the month before they ripen. So if you want good quality apples, uh, if it's 90 degrees for the month before, right before they ripen, they won't turn out quite as well. So, um, uh, fortunately for us, most of the apples ripen in the fall. And we don't have quite that situation. And, and a few apples that do ripen in the heat, uh, some of them take it pretty well. They're known to take it. We'll talk about those too. Um, now, the apples we pretty much evolved in southern Russia, central, you know, central, a, well, Eurasia, the central part of it. Um, pear trees, the European pears, 
which we don't grow here at all, came from the Middle East uh, or Eastern Asia area. But the there's also um, Japanese pear, like this one is a Japanese pear that originated in, in Eastern Asia. European pears, Western Asia. And then the Asian pears came from Eastern Asia, and they're not super close related, but they have uh, done some breeding work with them. Okay, so well, then we'll go over the apples first. So apples, uh, there are some apples that were originated when people spat out seeds in the tropical area areas. So we know they don't need much chill. Now the lower the chill on the apples, the early they tend to wake up and the early they tend to produce the fruit. Well, in our area, um, I don't have all the apples left that we'll mention. Um, we're sold out of most of our apples, and our one of our container growers is also sold out of most of our apples. Uh, not enough product the last few years, so. Um, but we'll we carry up. We'll get a whole selection of apples. Usually we carry around 10 or 12 varieties uh, that we get in every January. The Golden Door set, uh, lowest shell apple that we usually carry. It ripens. Unfortunately, it ripens in June. And this is the Golden Delicious offspring. They said they spat the seeds out in the Bahamas. Well, this thing grew in the Bahamas. The very low shell. It usually blooms Blooms in February and ripens in June. Now, unfortunately, June here is quite often quite gloomy, so the apples come out fairly tart. If you live in Hemet, they come out perfect. Right before it gets hot in Hemet, these apples are ripening. It's, it's perfect if you're another 10 miles inland. I think you're five miles. You're buying these hills here, you're actually in pretty good shape, of course. Then, we, then there's Anna which is one of my favorite apples that blooms uh, a little bit later in February and ripens in July. So and apples, which are shaped kind of similar to Red Delicious. They have the high shoulders and a little bit better flavor than Red. Red Delicious is kind of bland, sweet. Um, the Anna's have just a bit of tartness to them. So I would say if you really like honey crisp, you probably like Anna's. Um, there's another apple uh, in this group. It's Einschmier. Uh, Einschmier and Anna are from Israel. We don't grow Einschmier. We like the Dorset a little better than Einschmier. But they're both um, Einschmier and Dorset are golden delicious offspring. And then Anna is something else. But I don't recall the parents each of Anna. The disadvantage of the early apples uh, poor hang time, poor shelf life. So when you have an ant apple on the tree and it's kind of like three quarters red, it's time to pick. If you wait till it's totally red, it's getting pretty mushy by that time. I still eat them, but they're, they're starting to soften when they're pure red. The same with Dorset Golden. If you leave it on the tree too long, it starts to soften on the tree. Whereas most of their apples have better hang time. Most of the quote, later apples. So these bloom early ripen early they can certainly make two crops a year but okay so one of these stories about apples is is that they've been growing apples in the philippine highlands since the 1970s and they took grown beauty apples which need a thousand hours of chill from new york to uh, the philippines and they started growing them there and go well what's going on in the philippines so the philippines before they're growing them, they said it never drops below 57. So they don't have any chill in their area. There's zero chill. But what they do is, you know, the crop's ripening up. And they said two weeks after they pick the crop, they strip all the leaves off their tree. And without any leaves on them, the buds that are now exposed without any leaves, so the 
there are, there's hormones come out of each leaf that prevents the next set of buds from opening up. But if you remove the leaves around them, so the hormones are no longer being made by these leaves, this tree wants now wants to refoliate itself, uh, and the buds are there to do it. So what they do is two weeks after they pluck off all the leaves, they bloom and make another crop. So they can do this year round. They make they they can pick off the leaves and make a new crop start at that time. Now we've tried it on a lot of fruit, a lot of the apples. So the ant endorse it because the apples ripen so early. You have enough time to get that second crop, and you just pick off a lot of flowers, a lot of leaves around the the potential where the flower buds are are located, and then they bloom in July, and the fruit ripens around October into November. With most of the other apples, like Fuji, they ripen in October, even in hang to December. There's no time. You can't get that second crop on. Sometimes in the summer, if you have a drought shock and you lose leaves on a branch because you didn't water enough, then the tree blooms in the middle of summer and you get little fruit forming in the fall that actually taste fine. They just don't have any time to size up. Though the early apples, you can get two crops on them. Uh, we have a lot of customers tell us, oh, their ant apple has fruit on it year-round. They pick year-round. So, so the early apples like these, the low-chill apples, can fruit most of the year. Now, the other apples need more chill. They, you know, if you were in Oregon or in Central California where most apples, commercial apples are grown, each variety has a two week bloom period because, you know, as they, they each have their own chill, they wake up when that's met and it warms up. So almost every apple blooms for about two weeks and then they make their fruit and they get going. So here, the apples can't figure out whether now it's warm enough now. They said, okay, we're going to wake up because it's warm. But they wake up real slowly. So they, the book says in Southern California, most of the regular apples bloom for a period of two to three months. They just can't figure out when, when to wake up. So they just kind of send out flowers, May, June, sometimes in July. So if you're in Oregon or Northern California, you've got to have, okay, so apples and pears are pretty much self-fertile. However, the quality of the fruit is better if you have a pollinator around to pollinate them. Uh, and that's because if you only have one tree, they make a lot of fruit with just one seed. And if you only have one seed in the apple, the apple is lopsided, flat on one side, round on the other. So it's nice to have your full complement of seeds in there. And to do that, you need cross pollination with a different variety. Well, if you're in, like if you're in Oregon, you, you pair up the Fuji apple with the gallon because they bloom at the same time. Here, any of the later blooming apples can work because none of them know when to wake up. So they're all this kind of uh, waking up uh, at at overlapping quite a bit. So we don't have to worry about as much about timing of the bloom on the later apples. They seem to be the early apples. There's only two we carry. So you and I've grown this Anna without the Golden Door set, and I do get a lot of lopsided apples. But I still, yeah, they're still good. I just didn't like Doris is good enough to keep it around, so I don't. But, uh, um, so the, of the regular season apples, Gala is August. It ripens in August. So it's a little early apple. Because of that, it tends to be small here, but a lot of people like Gala's. So if you don't mind them being a little bit small because they don't have as much time to develop, uh, they do quite well here. Uh, they'll hang till September, but August is their main month. And then you have John of Gold, which is a huge apple, um, more like September. And then uh, it would be uh, Fuji. Like October, and then Granny Smith, November. Now in Oregon, this would be October. 
but here we're late, so it's November. And um, Pink Lady, I would say December. And uh, my favorite apple, which we're sold out of right now, is Sundown, which is a terrible name to give an apple nowadays, uh, associated with Alzheimer's now. Um, now, the interesting thing about our favorite three, the best three apples we can grow here are probably these three. They're all from Australia. And Australia really has very little chill, if any. You know, Perth, Australia, where Pink Lady and Sendown are, come from, is the same latitude as L.A. Granny Smith is from Sydney, which is the same latitude as Mazatlan, Mexico. They said, Granny Smith, they grow those apples next to pineapples. So they're tropical. So they still do well, even though they don't get any chill there. <laughs> um, but Granny Smith is interesting. So if you pick Granny Smith in November, it's tart and green. But you can leave it on. I, I don't know what they do in Australia. They might just leave it on the tree till it turns yellow. Because here, if you leave it on past Christmas, it's yellow. And it's sweet. It loses a lot of the tartness. And it becomes super fragrant. By January, you can smell this from like 50 foot away. You can smell the apples ripening on your tree. So Granny Smith totally changes uh, the longer you leave it on the tree. Now in Australia, um, this is known as Crips Pink. So you see that label on apples here in the Crips Pink. And Sun Honors Crips Red. And in Australia, Crips Red is their number one dessert apple. And I would tell you, it, it is a little better than Pink Lady. Pink Lady, they, they, they brought over first because it's very distinctive looking. You know, it's got that rose and kind of greenish skin. Uh, definitely a sweet tart flavor. Sundowner looks like a Fuji apple. So it's not as distinctive. But it's a little bit less hard than Pink Lady and a little bit sweeter than Pink Lady. And it's, it's awful good. That's probably the best apple I've grown locally. It's also December. Now, if you, you know, if you got one bare root from us this year, it, the fruit on it will ripen October, November, just because it, again, it came down from up north. It had an earlier start, but normally here they ripen in December. And most of these late ripening apples will hang um, Granny Smith till February really has a real long hang time. Fuji does too. At Fuji can hang a long time also without getting mushy. So you can get apples from anywhere from June all the way into February if you pick the right ones. And in my own yard, the apples are like the last thing the birds would go after. And the rats and the mice, it, it wasn't their favorite thing to eat, but if it was the only thing left in January, then yeah, they went after them. But uh, for the most part, they'd rather eat the stone fruit or the other things than my yard than, than the apples. Okay, I've covered the apple tree. Any questions on the apple trees? <clears throat> yes. So I actually did get your variety of both your Granny Smith and your Sundown in this year, and I already have apples. Should I put them off? No. Okay. But thin them out. If you haven't thinned them yet, thin them out. Yeah. I mean, if you're in uh, Minnesota, you wouldn't want any apples the first year because they only have a four-month growing season. They just don't have the time. But our growing season's, you know, like nine months, ten months for apple trees. In fact, it's pretty much all year. Uh, this year we need to go up to, to strip the leaves. So what we do recommend is if your tree still has the leaves on it around March, strip them down. If, if it's a, if it's supposed to bloom, you know, April, May, June, like these apples do, strip off all the leaves in March. All you have to do to strip off leaves is do this with your fingers and just take them down the stem and all the leaves just pop off. Because the absence of the leaves will help it bloom better and more uniformly than if you just left the leaves on now some apples are notable in that they seem to make 
flower buds and where they, you would think they'd make leaves. So on most apple trees, where they make flowers, you can kind of tell where they're going to make flowers. Like this, the end of this branch here, there's a little round bud. That's a flower bud that's already developed for next year. But some apples like Anna, Dorset Gold, and Gala. It's like you have a branch that looks just like, just like this. It looks like it's going to be all leaves. It's all flower buds. They just produce flowers anywhere they want, it seems. Even if you don't see what looks like a flower bud, or this is a flower bud here and here. Even if you don't see a flower bud on that branch in the winter, they'll make one. As your as your emerge the foliage is emerging in spring, they'll make flower buds that quick. So there's some interesting differences there. Okay, pears. Now again, you know they also they sell like seventy varieties of apples, and most of them will grow. I mean, we get, actually get in if we got to put in Rayburn. So we ray burn it be right about here. And a lot of our uh, employees like Brayburn. One of our employees' sister grows Brayburn down in San Diego, and they're always bringing bags of it. Uh, and that one turns out to be a really good apple from New Zealand. Um, that one turned out to be good. Some of the customers swear Johnny Gold's the best apple they've ever eaten. But those are people right along the coast where it's cooler, not so hot in September. So people in Huntington Beach love John and Gold right on the coast there. And I, I have customers in uh, Laguna Niguel that raved about Fuji. They said, oh, this Fuji's we're growing is better than when they store. So. How about Finland? I can't believe it. Yeah. Well, we're warmer, so you want apples that ripen later in the year, or early, like Anna. You want it. You don't want it ripening during the heat of the summer. Although, you know, Anaheim compared to other parts of the country, not a hot summer climate. <laughs> we're rated. I think we're rated right here in Anaheim. We're rated uh, heat. Our heat is ten a uh, three. Like our our winter climate. The winter hardiness zone, we're in zone 11, 10, 11, which is how cold we get versus Canada, which is number one. Uh, and then heat zone compared to 10 in Florida, we're like three because we just don't get much of, we don't spend that much time in the 90s as much as, you know, if you live anywhere on the Gulf Coast, you spend from uh, May through October in the 90s, day and night. You just don't drop below 90. So uh, we're just not like that. I lived in Galveston for a couple of years, so that convinced me this is, that was not the place to really want to live. <laughs> okay. So on the pears, um, European pears just haven't been successful. Now, some references to tell that Comus pear, C-O-M-I-C-E, does well here. I grew that thing for 20 years, got one fruit on it. It's like, no. no. Um, now, what's interesting is that if you're along any of the major rivers in Orange County, the Santa Ana River, you can grow commas there. You can grow European pears along the San Juan Creek. Um, the, the lowest spots in the county have the coldest air in the winter. So I have a friend who lives a block off the Santa Ana River in Anaheim. He can grow almost any European pear he wants. It's just that cold right along that riverbed. Or if you're in the canyons, Laguna Canyon, Tribuco Canyon, Silverado Canyon, you can grow European pears if you want to. So, um, the Asian pears, we, this is an Asian pear. I hadn't seen an Asian pear produce a fruit for 30 years until this year. I, I didn't think we'd have the winters anymore, but this winter, even though it wasn't that cold, it was very cool in December. Now, we also grew this Asian pear. This is Hosui. Because we didn't know, this is a newer Asian pear. It's also the top-rated tasting one. 
And we didn't know the chill on it. Back in the 80s, when we had winters, I grew about a dozen varieties of Asian pears, and they fruited when we had 400 hours of chill. And then we hit 1990, and we dropped down into the 300-hour range, and they never fruited again. So we gave up on them for a long time until Hosui came around. We wanted to see what the chill on this one was. Uh, and it seems to be less than 400 hours. Uh, this year we might have gotten 300 to 350 hours of chill. And this thing bloomed right on time. I mean, it wasn't late and it made fruit. This is only its second year. So we're jazzed that uh, we got this one. It's got one, two, three, four, five on it. It had more and then most of them dropped off on their own. But it saved five, which is probably all, all it should hold anyway. And Hosui get, you know, it, it gets a little bit more orangey brown when it's ripe, but basically it looks like that. And they get about that big at the, at the store anyway. You get to see them that big and they're wonderful tasty. Great texture on them too. They got, they're, they're like eating crushed ice. They got crunchiness, but they're not hard. So they're real tender, crunchy, and really juicy. And when you eat this pear, you got to have a napkin around. So. Not as, they call, you know, Asian people think that European pears are too sweet, too slimy sweet. So they like this. They say it's, it has a more refreshing taste. But most Asian pears don't grow here, but Hosui did. Uh, the pears that we usually do are the hybrids. So Asian, and he crossed them with the European pears from from you know eastern, southern, southeastern Europe and, and the Middle East, and they got what are called the hybrid pears. And some of the hybrid pears don't need as much chill, so this one called Keeper is now our best seller. We still think it's over three hundred hours though, but it still seems to make fruit. So this is Keeper. We've also carried past hood. Uh, for a home needed too much chill, uh, the hood is fine in this area too. Um, Kiefer might have a little better flavor than the hood. I don't know. They're, to us, the pears are not as, quite as interesting as some of the apples are, but Kiefer, uh, and hood are the two that have performed the best for us in this area. Uh, both these are, well, they crossed Asian and European, got hybrids. Most of the hybrids weren't that good, so they recrossed the hybrids with European and got uh, Kiefer and Hood. So they're slightly more European in quality than the hybrids are. But they still have the low chill we need to get fruit. Another one that we're working with, and we're still experimenting with it, is another hybrid called Tenosui. I don't have any of these left to sell this year, but this is the one that was sitting next to this one and both bloomed. Tennessee is half Hosui and half Tennessee. Tennessee is a pair from uh, European origin. So it's another hybrid, but it's half this and half European. So it made a good pollination partner for this guy. And they bloomed at the same time. So the Tennessee is making fruit too, so we're going to have to keep that because we've never eaten Tennessee pear. But in the past, Tennessee has made fruit on the trees. We just kept selling them so fast we couldn't keep them around to, to taste the fruit on it. So we'll, we'll have to, you know, we both of them are, are in a special spot now where hopefully no one will find them and sell them. Uh, so we'll try both and see how well they do. Tennessee. So Hosui and Tennessee might be a pair we stay with. Now, we've also carried 20th century. Um, pear, right? Uh, what's the, it's, it's interesting. Our growers sell two pear trees. One is 20th century. The other one is 20th century underneath its Japanese name, which is, uh, I can't remember what it is now. Niji Seiki is 20th century in Japanese. So they have two, two varieties, but they're the same pair. 20th century was the lowest chill of the other Asian pears that we sell. 
and also totally self-fertile. So we keep this one around too, and in general, we'll carry these also. But I don't think 20th century is as good tasting as Hosui or the other ones. Okay, so those are pairs. Any questions about them? We can try them the same way as do apples. Uh, same problems. Uh, now, if you see actual fire blight going on on a pear tree, the best way to remove it is to amputate 18 inches below where you see the fire blight. But if I did that with this tree, if this was fire blight, I'd be cutting the whole tree down. So I'm just going to, you know, I'll break it off. But we'll just have to keep an eye on it. It, it may not have been fire blight, it might have been blossom blast, or sometimes fire blight just stops right there where it intersects with the trunk. So, hopefully that was the case and we don't lose the whole tree. I see a little browning around the edges, that was that heat wave. Uh, when we hit 103 in April, a lot of the trees got singed. It's a little warm to hit that new growth that early in the year. And these kind of look like suckers, but they're not. I might keep them. They might make a good uh, fruiting branch. Can you foliate pear trees like apple trees? You what? Oh, yeah. Yeah, pears is foliated really well. I mean, one of the classic ways they do pears, which doesn't make any sense, but it looks really neat, is they do pears like this. That's one of the classic Paris Valley shapes, but that's kind of odd. That's you won't get. Well, you can still get pears if you, you know, if you, if it's, if it's some some trees tend to make a lot of little nub nubby side branches. They call that um, spur type growth. And, and there's some apples too that instead of being real straight branches when they grow, they grow branches that are really knobby. And they tend to flower, even though they're going straight up, they tend to still tend to flower. I mean, if you look on the internet, you'll find columnar apples that are these spur type apple trees. So they just go one stem and there's apples hanging all up and down the stem. So one of the interesting things they do uh, to make these spur apples, so the way they did it, so like with most fruit trees and apple trees to make a new apple tree, you grow the rootstock and then you graft on one of these side branch buds. You just put it in that rootstock and then cut the top rootstock off and then this branch grows as this tree. On a lot of these spur type, to make this really wiggly type trunk, instead of taking the buds off of the branch, they take it off right where the flower buds are. This is called a fruiting spur. It doesn't want to grow, it wants to flower. So they take these buds and use these instead and they get this real weird type growth that just wants to make flower buds. <laughs> so that's a spur graft, spur using spur wood and they make, so you can buy, I think the Granny Smith comes uh, spur type, uh, Golden Delicious, they have spur type apples on that. Uh, where they've taken the bud wood off of the flower branch rather than the grow, growing branch. Okay, now we'll talk a bit about it. Banana here. I can't bring a full grown banana in the store. We just harvested a perfect pup off the side of it. The bananas are from. Um, from Malaysia originally. And they're grown throughout the warmer areas of the world. Uh, our favorite banana happens to be this one called Dwarf Brazilian. Uh, this is also a Dwarf Brazilian. Of course, they didn't originate in Brazil, but this variety was found growing bananas in Brazil. Um, around the world, it's got different names. So in the Philippines, it's called Catarina Prada. And why they call it the dwarf Hawaiian apple banana. And in most of those countries, it is their favorite banana. It's our favorite banana. Um, the difference, the difference is when you eat the fruit, the fruit's a little bit smaller. So the fruits still can get 
wide, but it's short, five inch fruit. Um, very smooth flesh, it's not mealy at all when you eat them. Very smooth, firm. Um, it doesn't get uh, old, well, it doesn't get softened up very quickly. So the skin on the fruit can be totally black and you peel it open, it's still firm. And it's a bit stronger flavored. So that's why they call it apple or actually to me, it's slightly more citrus flavored in there. Uh, so a lot stronger flavor. Um, they're also using it in a lot of breeding purposes because of its shelf, improved shelf life and because it's resistant to a certain disease that's wiping out the Cavendish type bananas, the store type bananas. So that's one of the reasons we grow this one. We still carry the Cavendish because, you know, I've grown Cavendish a few times and it is quite impressive when you grow them. Uh, like this will make a cluster of about 100, 120 bananas that weighs about 50 pounds or so, 30 to 50 pounds. Um, but if you do a Cavendish type, 80 pounds, I mean, in the tropics, they'll do 120 pounds on a cluster. It's pretty impressive when you have that many bananas in one cluster. So the way bananas grow is they start out as a, as small, and then they, this trunk just grows. Now it's interesting, it's, it's wider at the bottom. What's happening in a banana is the flowers and fruit are developing down here. And you'll see this taper all the way to the top as it grows. Um, leaves being up here. And bananas only have, I think they said 27 leaves. From the time that they form off their mother plant, they only have 27 leaves to go through. So here, the, the first leaf was down here, second leaf there, third leaf was here, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. Once they hit their entire set of leaves, the flower bud starts shooting up the trunk, and the trunk, and you can see this as your banana is sitting there, the taper disappears as this is going up the trunk. Because the trunk is like a big piece of celery. It's, it's not real firm or anything, so you see this bulge going up your trunk. And then you see it go out the top, so it comes out of the top as a huge bud that hangs down and, and the bud scales fall off and you get the bananas forming first. Each being a hand, hand of about 10 to 13 bananas. So you have the bananas like that. So all these are female flowers come down first. And then below that, you'll get your male flowers that form down here. And then this bud just keeps making more male flowers all the way till it hits the ground just about. Um, this whole cycle from, so this thing at the same time, it's making babies that branch off from the bottom and come up the side. And this whole process in a, in a farm, with, well, here in California, but this way, because I don't know how fast they're faster in the tropics. So here, from the time this is comes out of the dirt and becomes, you know, this came out of the dirt and be, and flowers is one year, and the time for the fruit to ripen is almost another year. So it, it's a two-year cycle from this to ripe fruit when you harvest it. Some years our weather totally messes up. Like 2008, when we didn't get any heat till June that year. I remember the crepe myrtle trees did not leaf out till June. I was going, my God, these things are really late. Because we've seen crepe myrtle trees leaf out in January and bloom in January during the heat, the hot winters we had. But 2008, they did not put out any leaves till June. They just stayed sleeping. So the bananas didn't grow an inch from, say, October to June that year. So the bananas were hanging up there 15 months before they were ripe. They just stayed on the tree, uh, green. They just didn't move. So bananas do not like it below 80 degrees. If it's below 80 degrees, they're just sitting there doing nothing. So from October to usually till April, they do nothing. They just sit. 
And then from April through October, they're growing like a weed. Uh, so in the tropics, these bananas ripen maybe in six months. Here they take 10 months minimum for the fruit to, to ripen on the tree. And then after this is ripe, well, usually you want to pick it before, the, you know, just as the bananas are starting to turn yellow, you pick it. Because if you leave it on a tree much longer, in nature what happens is all the skin split open right away. So all this fruit is out in the open, you got to eat it really fast. So we like to pick them when they're still, now when they're forming, um, the fruit itself is deeply creased. And then as they fill in, they look like balloons. They start really looking like balloons and the creases are almost gone. So you know it's filling out. Now usually, you know, commercially they pick them when they're just, when there's no more, when the creases are pretty no, but they don't wait till they turn yellow at all. They send them to us, they ship them green. So if you pick them too early, because the first time I grew bananas, you know, I waited five months and went, five months, you know, this has got to be long enough. So I picked them off and they still ripen. But the fruit inside was about that big. It still tasted fine. They just don't make much meat at five months. It takes them 10 months here to get that thing filled in. There's no seeds in our bananas. Now, they breed bananas because occasionally you'll find a banana that puts seeds in the fruit. They're pretty big seeds. So that's how they breed new types of bananas. They find one or two in an orchard that might be making seeds. And then they'll use that for breeding purposes, but for the most part, our bananas are seedless. So they don't need any pollination either. So this trunk, uh, so you pick it when it's still green. You can hang it in your patio, in the shade, or in your garage, or inside the house. Uh, the one thing to know about bananas is the sap is really badly staining. So when you cut any part of banana, the leaf or anything, you cut it and a drop comes out. Uh, a lot of my, you know, from 10 years ago, I had a lot of clothes that had brown khaki colored patches because I was working on the bananas. And when you cut this off, it just drips for like an hour or two and you get a blood stain on your sidewalk. I mean, it looks exactly like a blood stain on the sidewalk and it lasts for six months on the sidewalk, so it's pretty nasty. So I'll put a, my trash can underneath where it's dripping to catch that. Interestingly, the entire banana plant is edible. So in co different countries, they use, you know, we have a customer whose wife is from the Philippines. She wants the, the buds. She can um, process the buds so that they're edible. And they wrap food with the leaves with uh, food with wrap, wrap leaves around the food and they cook them. And you can do something with the trunk too. My dog used to like to eat the trunk. <laughs> Especially as it was fermenting. So you have to get rid of, now in the banana orchard, like a friend of mine, uh, Doug Richardson, he had the banana orchard up in La Conchita. I don't know. If you're old enough to remember that, driving north of Santa Barbara, there is this farm on the side of the road where they're actually selling bananas. The only banana farm in the continental United States, well, at least in California, was La Conchita. And he had his bananas growing there. Um, they got messed up because there was a landslide in La Conchita that wiped out part of the town, wiped out part of their orchard, so they had to move it. But uh, he still grows a few bananas on private property in around Santa Barbara. And he teaches uh, at one of the colleges up in Santa Barbara. So anyway, uh, so there used to be banana orchard up there. So the Cavendish bananas are a different species than the, say, the plantains, you know, the plantain bananas that you cook. So the genetics of the cab, the sort type bananas, they said the genetics, it's triploid, is an AAA, and the plantain bananas, many of which are hardier to cold, some are not, some are hardier to cold. They're, they're also triploid, but DDD. The dwarf Brazil, which is our favorite, happens to be an ABV. So it's mostly plantain, but some store, but it picks up 
most of the store quality's fruit, but it's got a lot of the plantain's hardiness. And that's one of the reasons we like it, because it's uh, like a regular store banana, the Cavendish, if it goes below about 45 degrees, you not only lose the fruit, you lose the foliage. So 45, below 45, that banana starts to freeze in your garden. So you have to time the, if you grow a dwarf Cavendish like Williams is one of the dwarf Cavendish, Enon Huigante or other names you'll see. Williams was the most impressive ever grew. It's the one that, you know, well, usually when I, I cut these clusters off, like on Dwarf Brazilian, I can saw it with one hand and hold the cluster with the other. Dwarf Brazilian, I said, there's no way. This thing is too heavy. So what I did is I set a trash can underneath it filled with, with, uh, leaves. So when I cut it, it just dropped to the trash can. Uh, there's no way I can hold that 80 pound with one arm. So we just let it fall. But, um, you have to time them so the fruit ripens late fall. So, and you don't always get the timing right, but usually the first pups coming out that year will bloom exactly one year later, say around March is perfect, and hopefully those fruit will ripen before the first frost in the summer. And you can harvest it at that. So you have to watch that timing. Now we have five years, 2014 through 2017, didn't seem to drop below 45 degrees in the winter at all. So people are growing bananas year round. But, uh, this last, well, even this last year, we didn't get that cold. It just stayed really cool. But <coughs> two winters ago, we had uh, a real good frost, one real good frost. That would have messed up the Cavendish bananas. Now the dwarf Brazilians, which is the ABB, This one, you don't lose the fruit unless you go below 27 degrees. Let's go way colder. You don't lose the leaves unless you get below frost around 30. But the bananas will hang on till about 27. So there was only one winter we lost the bananas on Dorp Island. That was 1990. We had 23 degrees two days in a row. So we lost the fruit. We lost the entire trunks of our, of our Dorp Brazilians. They re-sprouted from the ground. So we lost uh, that, that crop that year. That's the record cold for Southern California. It was 1990, December 23, 24, 1990. Hit 23 degrees both mornings. I mean, we had ice this thick in our on our property. That thick didn't didn't uh, melt till noon those days. I think uh, they hit 13 in Escondido. They hit 17 in San Juan Capistrano. 13 in San Francisco that year. Uh, that was a nasty cold. Coldest ever record. You know, they've only been recording weather in California since 1868. So all this, you know, all these things they say about temperature, we only know it for a little over 100 years. We don't know it that far back. So, like, all the stuff about global warming, they're interpreting tree rings. They say, okay, if these rings were smaller, it must have been a colder year. If they were wider, it must have been but that's not always the case. The, the rings on trees don't correspond that well with the temperature. They respond to sunshine, uh, rain, all kinds of things. And to use the tree wings to record temperature uh, has been shown to be real faulty. So um, that part of our history is unknown for a lot, for most, most part. <laughs> what the actual temperature was uh, in the last couple thousand years anyway. Anyway, back to this. So, um, so Dwarf Brazilian um, can handle temperatures down below freezing uh, and it can also handle the wind better than most bananas. So, you know, 20 miles an hour will still ribbon the leaves and split them and turn them to ribbons, but on the Cavendish bananas, a lot of those, it breaks these whole things off at about 30 degrees. It just breaks them off. And bananas without leaves, they can't make any energy. Uh, Dwarf Brazilian, this area is strong enough, they can go to 50 miles an hour without being torn off. 
So Doug Richardson up in La Conchita used the dwarf Brazilian and their standard Brazilians as their windbreak trees for the rest of the bananas. So these are also the most wind tolerant banana we know. Uh, and it's also the only banana I know, well, there's a few that don't lean when the fruit's developing. So on most bananas, the fruit's so heavy as like in, as Cavendish is forming fruit, it, the trunk's doing this. By the time it's ripe, it's on the ground. Probably for a reason, so that pigs and things can eat the fruit and disperse the seeds when it hits the ground. But it gets in the way, so when you grow Cavendish or most other bananas, you take a couple of lodgepole stakes and make a tripod with the trunk and hold it up so it's not in your way. Dwarf Brazilian, you don't have to do that. Dwarf Brazilian, Standard Brazilian, and Manzano, we haven't had to stake them up. I like Manzano bananas. Those are those little tiny ones at the store. Uh, those, those do quite well here too. They seem to be as cold hardy as dwarf. They look like a dwarf, dwarf Brazilian. Now, dwarf Brazilian, uh, is the biggest banana we've ever seen, ever grown, except for the ornamental bananas. You see that big red banana trunks like this big around. Dwarf Brazilian, if you look at ours behind our greenhouse here, trunk is over a foot in diameter. Most bananas are about like this. Dwarf Brazilian, and that's why it doesn't lean. It's really, uh, it's bigger than the standard Brazilian. Standard Brazilian, a few feet taller. Dwarf Brazilian, much thicker. So it's swatter bananas. And I, I kind of like it too because the fruit's hanging higher than your head. Because when I grew the Cavendish bananas, I'd always forget I'd be wearing my hat, didn't see the fruit, bang! You know, it always hit the top of my head because it was hanging right at six feet, right where my hat hits hits the fruit. Your Brazilian's just a, a foot or so higher than that. So, so when you grow bananas, be aware that every generation's a little higher than the next. So you have to, when you grow them, we like to sink them in deep. Now, this is the perfect one to start with. This was taken off its mother when it was small. So it doesn't have as much energy to develop. This one is taken off even smaller. This is called a sword sucker because it came out of the ground with still its baby leaves. These now are mature leaves. The baby leaves are down here, so it didn't have as much energy because it was taken off its mother early, or sometimes they come off of dead trunks that already produce fruit. They don't have any energy anyway, so they're, they're smaller plants to start with, so they can take longer. Now, a lot of bananas sold in the trade are tissue culture grown. They're not pups off their mother to tissue culture, so they come to us like this big. So, whereas this one will have fruit next year, these tissue culture plants may take two years, a year longer to get the fruit on them because they didn't have any mother at all. And they're growing from a, you know, they're almost growing essentially from a seed. Tissue culture is almost like planting a seed. So they're slower to get to size. So if, if they don't, if they have a thin trunk thinner than this when you buy them in a one gallon, they, they were often tissue culture grown. You're talking a year longer because I was playing some bananas I got from other growers, and I'm going, wait now, this is its second year. It hasn't bloomed yet. And that it turned out to be a tissue culture propagation. So, so this one was taken off its mother just yes, uh, two days ago. So it, we left it on there till it was real massive. And it still has these, the, what they call the sword-like leaves. So this is real young plant that's big. So this is much better off. This will make a larger first crop than either of these two because it was on its mother uh and it was uh well just the ideal size and shape so that's like a huge bulb it only has like one root on it but it acts like a bulb it's just full of, of moisture so you can so if you were to get this one like these have roots on them because these have been in the pots three or four months this one you can pull right out and just put it in the ground as a bulb and it'll get going this doesn't have a mom now, so it won't get quite as big as if it was still attached to its mother. So if they're still attached to their mother, they'll get a trunk about 10 to 12 foot tall, 14 inches in diameter. 
by itself like this, it'll probably get about eight foot tall, maybe a foot in diameter, a little bit smaller. These might only get six feet tall, and the first crop on these might only have about 50 bananas. So, now I've grown bananas in the shade. Bananas in total shade look really pretty. They're more protected from the wind. They're spotless plants. They look better. But they in full shade, they make like 10 bananas. <laughs> Gorgeous plants, though. You grow them in full shade, they're beautiful. In the sun, they'll make more fruit. And generally, what they do is these trunks come out next to the main one. So you have to have some room. So what I would do in my yard is put it in the middle, have about a four foot dirt area around it. You know, I'll plant other bushes and things around here, but, and the foliage gets about 10 foot across, 10 foot of, of airspace. So you let the, you put the trunk in the middle. The new baby's going to come off to one side. So you figure, okay, a foot on this side, this trunk's going to come up. Um, you don't want too many trunks coming up at the same time. So commercially, well, the banana trunk, each trunk can produce around five to eight babies on it during its lifetime. So you don't want any babies forming until it blooms. So when this thing blooms, so the other ones you can just chop off there. Again, it's to get these off the plant, you can just get a little shovel there, kick it through it. It's like cutting through celery. It's not very hard to, to cut through them, especially if your dirt's soft. We put a lot of our top pot around it so the dirt's softer. But uh, keep clipping these off. You don't want too much competition with the sunlight. We found if you let five babies grow at the same time, same generation, they're all shading each other, you don't get any fruit. You just get male flowers. So ideally, you know, commercially in the plant and uh, the banana plant, plant, plantains, plantations, <laughs> banana farms, when this thing blooms, they allow one more to come up. And when this is ripe, this one's ready to bloom too, and then they allow another one to come up. So you choose the bananas coming up in the right spot. So it might be on this side, next one might be over here, might be over here. In about 10 years, you use up all that four foot of space, plus they're getting higher and higher in the ground. So you have options. What I did in my yard, because I couldn't raise the ground next to my house, I dug all these out, dug out a lot of the dead roots and their dead trunks, put a bunch of new soil in here and put my best pup back in the center of that when it went on for 10 more years. Now a friend of mine has his bananas on hillside. All he does is he keeps adding more dirt on top of everything. Because each generation will go higher, they've got brand new soil growing. He's kept his clump going for 20 years now in the same place, just getting a little higher each time he does it. So they say with bananas, they've actually done studies on this. The first generation, the roots look the healthiest. By the second generation, the roots of the first one have died off. So the second generation roots aren't quite as healthy as the first generation. As the older you get, the more dead roots you have around here. And the bananas get smaller and smaller. So you have to refresh them now and then. And again, you can just raise the soil up. If you have that advantage, you can raise it up in your location. Then you can do it that way. And you can certainly take these babies off and plant them other places. Just don't cut too many off the main mother at the same time because all the roots are shallow. You cut too many of these off, the mother falls over. So don't do them all at one time. We usually do one at a time on each trunk and then a couple months later do another one. And try to use a slender shovel so you don't cut off too many roots. So they're attached underneath the ground. And as you get older, they can start coming out above the ground. It's really easy to take those off. Questions on the banana test? Yes. So I should trim it. Harvest tool. Do I need to dig down to kind of pull them out or just cut them off? I mean, to. Again, uh, a saw cuts them real easy, but you can take a shovel blade and then just kick the shovel through the trunk. Now, because it weighs so much, especially dwarf Brazilians, what I would do is, and they do this off in orchards too, 
is this cut off the two foot of the trunk at a time, put throw it in your trash can. Next week, another two foot, because it's like 50 pounds. You don't want to take too much more than that at one time. And the plantations are like Doug Richardson's orchard. He would just take the trunk and take his machetes and chop them up and leave them dry on the surface to save all the nutrients from the trunk. But you do have to be careful in your yard. Well, like if I did that, it would be fermenting in my yard. <laughs> My dog loved to, you know, I tried that once. My dog would be eating the fermenting banana trunks. So, uh, oh, so we, we just discard them. But if you want to be really, you know, save everything, then you chop them up real finely so that they dry out pretty fast. So they don't ferment. Although apparently that wasn't poisonous to my dog. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Is it possible to like decluster or prune that huge mass of amount of bananas, you know, so you don't have quite so many or? Well, they don't ripen all at once. So when we do dwarf Brazilian, uh, if you hang it up, you know, if you don't leave them on the tree too long until they all burst open at one time, uh, you, you bring it in your, in a, especially bring it hanging inside your kitchen, say, it ripens over a three to five week period. And, you know, these are small bananas. My daughter would eat five a day. So if you have a family of four, you can go through that whole cluster pretty easily. Uh, now, commercially, they'd always cover the cluster with a blue plastic bag. So what they do is, after you formed all the female fruit, you start seeing the male flowers, which fall off, so you know they're male. You cut off this right here so it saves it from, you know, They'll, they'll be making flowers all the way until the bananas are up. So let's cut that off so this saves them some energy. And they put a blue plastic bag over the cluster. They said the trapping, the humidity, and, uh, uh, for some reason, the blue bag would let blue light through, made the bananas significantly larger than they would if they were not covered in blue plastic. Okay. So my friend's orchard up in La Conchita, they would cover all their bananas. Now, I haven't done this, but if you go to Smart and Final Iris, you'll find the blue trash pegs that they used to cover the bananas. So I haven't compared. I just don't have as many trees, so I can't put one on this one and not on the other and, and compare how their how the growth rate is different. It does look kind of funny, though, but that's what they do commercially. It's bananas cover them with blue plastic. Does the root system go out real far? No, the roots don't live very long. The roots only live a couple of years, so they go out about so far and stop, and then they die. So nothing permanent about bananas. Can you go ahead and have those keeper? Yeah, but there's not much room. Well, if you grow some of the smaller bananas, like dwarf Brazilian, a trunk wide, a foot wide, the uh, this girl is only 28 inches across. So you have room, you don't really have room, much room in there. So, but yeah, you can. I mean, I'm growing in 24 inch boxes and you have to choose which which pup you want to put in there, but you won't be able to do it for many years in there because you've, you fill up that area pretty quick. But yeah, you can do it. Any other questions? The one banana that's absolutely gorgeous and I'm always looking for, if you ever find one, um, the I I banana um, from Hawaii. The leaves are variegated. The whole plant's variegated, but it's kind of white, cream, green, and gray blotches all over the leaves and the fruit. It's just a really gorgeous banana. I had one, but it was back in the '90s. It was too cold in the winters. We had, you know, we're getting 30 to 30 high 30s, and it killed my I I. But the waiting time to get one now is apparently supposed to be like five years because there's such high, you know, they're so gorgeous. That's a beautiful plant. I had it making fruit and then that winter killed it. So, but if you're traveling through San Diego area, you might find an eye of eye similar. Okay. Thank you very much. I have a futurist tree question. Okay. It's totally. Let me turn this one off for a second. You're welcome.
Don't be forgetful. I have to feel more place in the water. Oh, that's 